Lorena Hollyfield has written her first fiction novel, Tobacco Sun. In this edition of Quintess Close Ups, I sit down with Lorena one on one. And be sure to download the free Quintess Close Ups app in your Apple or Google Play stores. Lorna, it is so good to see you. Oh, it's so good to see you. I appreciate this. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Oh, anytime. I appreciate it. Oh, anytime for you. Yeah. And according to Goodreads.com, Lorena Hollifield was born in Asheville, North Carolina, but now enjoys the island life outside of Charleston, South Carolina, with her husband, Kimsey, and two months, Scarlett and Daisy. Yeah. Tell me, what got you from Asheville to here? Love of the ocean. I mean, it was kind of the salt calling my name a little bit. Um, we vacationed here a lot when I was a kid. I mean, that's what you tend to do when yes. you're from the mountains. Right. You drive down the South yes. Carolina coast and do your thing. Um, and I don't know, I always felt a connection to Charleston my entire life. And mm -hmm. I'd like to think, I don't know, I'm kind of a Southern belle deep down. Yes. And something just about the buildings and the cobblestone streets right. appealed to me. And I told my husband that uh, I wanted to get down here someday. And we actually had an opportunity to come for his job several years ago. Mm -hmm. But then we went back to Asheville and he started his own company. But mm -hmm. we were like, we're going to find a way to get back. And so when the time was right, we were able to come back. Thank God for that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Lorna Hollenfield, the author. Goodreads.com writes this quote. She's been an author from the time she could speak, always spinning yarns for anyone who would listen. She began her professional writing journey as a tourism and travel blogger before finally deciding to pursue her dream of publishing fiction. Tobacco Sun is her first novel, and she she's delighted to share it with the world. Why fiction in your mind? When I was, I've always been creative. And when I was a little kid, I was an only child for a long time. And I've told this story a lot, that, but I'm an extrovert, and that's just my nature. Right. And so I would always just create people to talk to. I didn't have one imaginary friend. I had, you know, like 57 imaginary <laughs> friends. And they, oh, they had all kinds of things going on. They would get in arguments with each other. I mean, there was always, like, this one can't be next to this right. one. I mean. But again, all you know, in my head, my parents probably thought I was like cuckoo. cuckoo, cuckoo <laughs> um, but I kind of think that's where my love of fiction started. Mm -hmm. And so, and then my, you know, my grandmother taught me to read when I was really young. And so I started just kind of writing things down as they would come in my head. And mm -hmm. I feel like it's just kind of always been with me. Wow. So it's not something I planned. It mm -hmm. just is. Yes, indeed. You're right about that. Tobacco Sun. Goodreads.com also wrote this quote, the year is 1947, the war is over, Jackie Robinson has just integrated baseball, and Frank Sinatra, Sinatra that is, breezes in over the fuzzy earwaves. A sense of relief is finally sweeping the nation, everywhere except Tobaccoville, North Carolina. Why Tobaccoville? So, I first saw Tobaccoville when I was traveling with my husband. We were on a little road trip and we drove through just kind of the middle of nowhere and it was just very salt of the earth people very small houses but they there was something about just it was almost somewhere in between spooky and romantic the way the the sway of the tobacco leaves was and i felt like it was just full of secrets and i tell people that all the time and that i looked at my husband and i was like but there's so many secrets in that tobacco and so I just started seeing these characters, but then years later I heard this song and it kind of jogged the memory of Tobaccoville. Right. And um, it's a song called Poison and Wine by a band that broke up called The Civil Wars. And I love, love, love them. I'm still mourning it. I've said yeah. it in other interviews. Right. I wish that they were still together. Yes. But I heard the song and started seeing some of my characters and then the plot story come together and I just started writing it. But um, I like that Tobaccoville was it's like the characters. It's raw, it's underdressed, it's nothing fancy, right. but it has this like huge story bubbling under its under the surface. Mm -hmm. An article went on to read this. Beyond a rule feels feels that is that are pregnant with decades of secrets, a mysterious Holloway pinup is jailed for murder while her facially birthmarked half sister may hold the answers as to why. Who is a mysterious Hollywood pinup? Okay, so there's two sisters. Sidra and Jimmy Lynn. Sidra is, she has become part of the birth of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, she's beautiful. She's always been beautiful. And Jimmy Lynn has always had the port wine birthmark mm -hmm. on her face. And so she's, she feels stained on not just her skin, but she feels stained on the inside because of that. 
And then we also find out that she endures, and we find this out really quickly, so this gives nothing away, but right. that she's an abuse victim. And so all of this kind of has to do with why the murder occurred. There's a family member involved. Um, it goes back to their own mother and mm. to things that happened in the past. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of the secrets that are, right. that are hiding in the fields. But Sidra is, she's spicy. She's fun. But she, um, she's not very nice. Mm. <laughs> I can understand why with her situation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And speaking of which, the article says this, quote, the two girls, estranged for years, share a haunting past, a shell shocked love interest, and maybe even a cruel destiny. Do mountains of lies, the truth that inevitably comes, pouring out of the tobacco leaves, will come to light. Will this light reveal the path to the siblings', siblings foreordained destruction, or are they long awaited deliverance? Will they realize they each other hold the power to set the other free before it's too late? Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Heavy stuff, huh? Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's true because Jimmy Lynn has a secret that could set Sidra free. Mm. But Sidra has something that could set Jimmy Lynn free. Mm. But I can't say you know, right, what that right, is because right, I'll right, give right, a lot. Right, 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 right. And, you're, and people might be thinking, you know, Sidra's the one in jail. What's Jimmy Lynn shackled by? Right. But um, there, she has other problems. She has things that she can't do on her own because of things that have happened to her. Mm -hmm. And so it, they both kind of, they complete each other. And so the whole time you're kind of wondering if they're going to realize that and kind of come together to... To make a happy ending or not. Um, it also says this quote, a story of heritage, hurt, and somehow hope. Tobacco Sun keeps you on the edge of your seat while you find yourself rooting for redemption. A story of heritage, hurt, and somehow hope. Mm -hmm. Tobacco Sun keeps you on the edge of your seat while you find yourself rooting for redemption. Okay, what is your definition of redemption after writing this story, this novel? I think redemption is always when something finds the light when it's been in the dark. I think redemption is about second chances. And the whole theme of being humans is about second chances. Sure. And I mean, the theme of, you know, many religions are, are forgiveness, redemption. And without it, what would we be? Mm -hmm. I mean, every bad thing that happened, we would just stay in that place. Mm -hmm. And the, to the tobacco leaves themselves actually are really rugged plants right. and they have to burrow in the dirt. It's really arid, sure. it's, it's crappy dirt. That's why they planted it where they right. did, in the kind of arid <laughs> soil of North Carolina in the middle. But they have to stretch up and find the light to live. Mm -hmm. And so my characters are a lot like the, you know, the tobacco stalks that right. they grew up around. And so they have to reach up and find the light. And mm -hmm. that's kind of what I want to encourage people to do, no matter how raw, no matter what you went right. through when you were three years old right. or 15 years old or what terrible thing might have happened or it might be a small thing that happened but feels terrible to you. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's always a, a, refre a, a refresh, a reset button. And um, I want people to, to see that, you know. I've had to believe in that at, in times of my life. Oh yeah, trust yeah. in God, absolutely. Yeah. Tobacco Sun, if I would have flipped through this right now, what page, what chapter should I go to? Oh man, <laughs> I don't know a chapter number, but I know what some of my favorite scenes are. Mm. Um, I love actually the second chapter, because it has multiple narrators, so it goes back and forth, right. mainly between Sidra and Jimmy Lamb, but yeah. then it, we get you know some anecdotes from, from others. But um, I love when Jimmy Lynn first speaks about Sidra, mm -hmm. and she's sitting and she's looking up at a poster of her, like pinned up at the bar, and she's just looking at her kind of, you know, in this typical like late forties like bikini pose, mm -hmm. and everybody's just salivating over her. The bartender's like, "Oh my God, do you know her?" And I love when Jimmy Lynn describes her that she's kind of like a bird that you watch every day. Mm -hmm. You know, it lives in your yard, right. it nests in the tree, right. but you're not going to get to touch it no. because it's not going to let you. Right. And then she also kind of compares her to one of those um, caterpillars that have the, the spines and the horns. Right. Like they're so beautiful. And she touched one when she was a little bit stung her. Mm -hmm. And she says, that's Sidra. Mm -hmm. And she said, but I don't know the girl in the picture. And so she, that's kind of, you can see the disconnect there. Right. And that starts revealing things about them. But I, I, I like the narrative in, in that chapter. 
a silly question. Yeah. But if you could go back and republish this novel, what would mm -hmm. you add to it? I wouldn't add anything to it. Mm -hmm. No. Um, I think that it came out exactly how it should be. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, because the way it ends, it kind of ties up nicely with some characters, but then with another character, you kind of wonder maybe what happens. Mm -hmm. And it's a bittersweet ending for some people um, because one character, in my mind, it ends perfectly and she finds her redemption. I don't want to give anything away. Sure, sure, sure. But she finds it by being selfless. And I think some people are looking for the actual, like, where did she go? Where did she live? What mm -hmm. did she do? Mm -hmm. How did that? But I, I'm not going to ever reveal that. There will right, never be a right, sequel. Right, there right, will right, never right, be. Right, right, right. Yeah, because it's not. But my mom is the biggest one. She's like, I just want to know what happens with her. <laughs> and uh, But my dad's like, no, no, you did the right thing. Mm -hmm. And then they're like arguing with right, each other right. about it. But um, I wouldn't have anything. I think it, it came out how it should have. How it should have. Mm -hmm. yeah. Obviously, this is your first uh, fiction novel, I believe. Yes. What is next for you in your mind? Another one. Uh, another novel, hopefully a bigger deal. Um, I'm kind of one of these people, I'm never satisfied. Mm -hmm. I'm happy, yes. Mm -hmm. Blessed, yes. appreciative, yes. Satisfied, never. Um, I want to write books the rest of my life, that's sure. all I want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so I finished a novel called The Weeping Jug, mm -hmm. and I have an agent who's interested in it. So um, I love, you know, pen name publishing, and I love mm -hmm this label and I love everything they've done for me and um, but you know maybe see what the next step is where the next highest ground is yes. and just see if I can be part of that so um, yeah that's what I'm doing next just keep I'm just continuing what I'm doing now and speaking of being a part of you told me this off camera but Mary Alice Monroe yeah she's a part of this book as well in the beginning mm -hmm. talk to me about your relationship with her um, I met Mary Alice. I jokingly tell people I stalked her um, <laughs> because she's like, she's a great lady. Yes, she is. Um, and I'd heard such great things about her. And this is when I'm still what I call the trenches. Right. That's what I refer to as the period of time where I was just submitting my manuscript mm -hmm. and no one wanted it. And I was oh, getting yeah. rejected left and right. right. And I was, you know, like in the dark drinking whiskey in my own bathtub. Mm -hmm. I mean, seriously, it, my, like that's not a joke. My husband came in and I was just like drinking in the dark in the tub and he thought I was crazy. But it gets like that when you yeah. love something that much yes. and it takes a decade to make it happen. Yeah. And yeah, so finally um, I went to a book signing, a book release party actually that Mary Alice was having. And I just told her what a fan I was and how much I admired her and asked for her advice. Right. And she introduced me to her editor. She introduced me to an agent. And he actually didn't pick me up at that time, but he helped me clean Tobacco Sun up and get mm. it ready. Oh. And gave me a lot of advice. His name's uh, Rick Pascacello, and, and he was so, so helpful. And um, so those introductions gave me a lot of confidence, mm. and I wasn't afraid to be part of the literary world. I was like, I belong here. Because one thing I've noticed, you can't be good enough for somebody to reach up and pull you into the limelight you deserve to be in. They're not going to do it. You no. have to just step into it. Right. And it took me forever to realize that. Mm. And so she kind of helped me feel comfortable with that. And then um, I did an article on her for a blog and wrote some things about her. And while I was there interviewing her, she's like, oh, do you, do you need a blurb for your, for your book? And I was like, yes. yes. I mean, I was going to ask you that. Yes. I, I felt like I was still like, you know, like maybe I'll ask her in a month. Yes. Maybe yeah. I'll, you know, take her to dinner. And she's just like, oh, I, I would love to. She's, mm. you know, I, I think you're really good. I, yes. think, I mean, it just gave me so much confidence. Yeah. And I mean, had me in her home and just reached out. And that's what I always said if I ever made it that I would do for yes. other aspiring authors. Mm. Like, I don't want to be right. a jerk to them. Right. I want to be a friend in the industry. Sure. Yeah. And she was a friend to me, and I'm very grateful to her. Yeah. Very. Obviously, you are grateful and happy to have Mary Alice Monroe in your book in your life. Mm -hmm. What would it be a letter to her beginning with, Dear Mary Alice Monroe? Okay. If I were to say, Dear Mary... Uh, <laughs> it's not over. <laughs> if I were to say... Yeah. If I were to say, Dear Mary Alice, I would say, you know, thanks for not blowing me off. Mm -hmm. It meant something. It was enough. Yeah. Um, thanks for welcoming me into the literary world and treating me like I had a place there. It gave me confidence and 
that's priceless. Yes, indeed. Yeah, it would be short and sweet. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Lorena Hollenfield, thank you so much for your time. I really yeah. appreciate this. Oh, thank you for having me so much. Anytime. I appreciate it. Anytime. Yeah, it was yeah. fun. Hey, likewise. Yeah. Yeah, thank you.